When you imagine a great art heist, what do you picture? Mission Impossible style acrobatics? The reality is far less high tech, which makes it all the more intriguing. Discover the story of the little Italian man who spirited away the Mona Lisa in 1911 with little more than an art smog and the help of a clueless plumber. Learn about how one man stole the Mona Lisa, the greatest art theft in history. If someone asked you to name an Italian man associated with the Mona Lisa, you would undoubtedly reply Leonardo da Vinci. But if someone asked you who Vincent Perugia was in association with the same piece of art, would you know the answer? If not, keep watching. For today on Intrigued Mind, we will discover just that. Viewers, please meet Vincent Perugia, possibly the most audacious and downright lucky art thief in history. His successful swiping of the most famous painting of all time would come to be known as one of the greatest art thefts in history. But who was this brazen thief, and how on earth did he do it? Here's how. First up, here is a crash course in the story of how the Mona Lisa came to be in the first place. Well, one version at least. As the story goes, a very wealthy Italian merchant, Francesco del Giocondo, decided to commission Leonardo to paint his wife, Lisa Girandini, because she had popped out a few kids for him and was therefore deserving of being preserved for posterity. Painted on poplar wood, Miss Giocondo's portrait was started in 1503 and completed in 1517. Imagine sitting for a portrait that took 14 years to complete. Lisa Girandini must have had the patience of a Catholic saint. According to stories, the artist kept the lady in question entertained during these torturously long sittings with musicians, and her bemused smile seems to reflect this. Back in those days, the starving artist was all too real, and artists relied on the patronage of very rich men. They were basically like short-order cooks and painted what they were told to paint, except Leonardo struggled to complete the Mona Lisa. He pored over every detail, the folds of her velvet gown, the positioning of her hands, and the sfumato technique he used to create her enigmatic eyes and smile. It took him over a thousand hours to finish the work that would become his masterpiece, or at least unfinish it, which is what the artist felt the painting was, unfinished. After all that time, the Renaissance genius decided he would keep her all for himself, telling his patron he was not satisfied with his portrait. Imagine how irritated Francesco must have been to wait all that time for nothing. It is hard to believe Leonardo's given reason for keeping the Mona Lisa. Perhaps he was the first to fall under her strange spell. In two versions of events, Leonardo bequeathed La Gioconda to his apprentice, or took her with him to France and offered it to the king, Francis I. Either way, Francis did purchase the Mona Lisa for 4,000 gold ducats, which is how this lady with a mysterious smile ended up in France. Now, let's get back to Vincent Perugia. He was born in 1881 and died in 1925. Not so fun fact, he died on his birthday. Vincent was himself an artist. He can't have been a very good one, because in 1911, he was working at the Louvre Museum in Paris, France as a picture framer. Vincent thought the Mona Lisa was an Italian work of art, given it was painted by an Italian artist that had been stolen by France. More on this later, and he was trying to repatriate it to Italy. Interestingly, the Mona Lisa was not so nearly famous and beloved as she is today during Vincent's time. She was little more than a small portrait hanging on a wall packed with loads of timeless works of art including Paolo Veronese's enormous marriage at Cana. Vincent's extreme act of kleptomania only enhanced the Mona Lisa's reputation as a masterpiece. But like King Francis I, who had paid the modern-day equivalent of 10.7 million American dollars for the painting, Vincent knew good art when he saw it. He contrived to steal the Mona Lisa for about two years before he walked out the museum back door with her under his arm, quite literally. Like all good criminals, Vincent did his homework and plenty of reconnaissance in the lead-up to this grand theft arto. At 7 a.m. on August 21st, Vincent donned a white smock to blend in with the other workers, walked into the Salon Carré where the Mona Lisa hung on the wall, lifted her from four iron hooks, and took her to a staircase where he hid long enough to remove the painting's protective case and frame. He then wrapped it in his smock, tucked it under his arm, and left via the same door he had entered through. It is more sad than funny that he was of such small stature he could not hide the painting under a shirt. She is only 33 inches high after all. In one version of events, this door, the back door, was locked and he took the doorknob clean off in his attempts to flee the scene of the crime. A plumber came upon Vincent and his parcel. He must have been the epitome of grace under pressure. According to the story, he simply told the plumber he found the door that way and asked him to use his tools to open it. The plumber was very accommodating and before long, Vincent and Mona Lisa were strolling down the route together. Apparently, security was pretty lax in those days at the Louvre and the sight of a missing painting was not cause for immediate alarm, since they may have been removed for cleaning. 
He would be her keeper for the next two years, and the theft catapulted Miss Del Giocondo into infamy, courtesy of the police and the media, from that day forward. If Helen of Troy was the face that launched a thousand ships, then Mona Lisa was the face that launched a thousand postcards, t-shirts, and coffee mugs. People started to line up in queues outside the museum, a trend that continues to this day. As it turned out for Vincent Perugia, stealing the Mona Lisa was not the most challenging aspect of his crime. It would be offloading her for cash that would pose a problem, and to that end, she decorated Vincent's apartment in various positions, from under the sink, to inside a cupboard, to the bottom of a trunk. The Parisian police were perplexed. They interviewed Vincent himself twice for the theft, then let him go, and even pointed the finger at famed Spanish cubist artist Pablo Picasso. After two years of languishing in Vincent's apartment, unloved and unseen by her adoring public, Vincent packed La Gioconda into his trunk – oh wait, she was already there, wasn't she? – and took her back to his native Italy, where he tried to flog her off to an artist in Florence. This artist contacted the director of the Uffizi Gallery. The Mona Lisa would have been in good company at the Uffizi, for there resides another of da Vinci's works of art, the Adoration of the Magi, along with the usual canon of Italian greats – Michelangelo, Giotto, Caravaggio, Botticelli, et al. Both men played along with Vincent long enough to have him arrested. Vincent was sent to prison for a little over one year, but he got out after seven months, ostensibly due to the patriotic nature of his crime. Vincent asserted he was taking Mona Lisa back to her motherland, where she belonged. There are a few holes in his reasoning, however. Firstly, Vincent had written a letter to his father saying that he would essentially bankroll his retirement. Secondly, and most damningly, he tried to sell the painting to the Uffizi. His detractors asserted that if Vincent was as indeed as patriotic as he would have everyone believe, then he simply would have donated the Mona Lisa, rather than try and profit from his thievery. So how did things pan out for this mismatched odd couple? Well, Mona Lisa ended up back in the place she had called home since 1797, courtesy of Napoleon Bonaparte at the Louvre Museum in Paris, France. There, she would be gawked at by thousands of strangers each day, if only long enough to catch a glimpse of her, but not long enough to study her. Hey. But at least these visitors can say, I've seen the Mona Lisa. For those of us that have neither the money nor the patience to take a trip to Paris to visit her at the Louvre, there is always the online electronic version which has been digitally retouched to reduce the effects of aging. Who would have thought this classy brunette would have so much in common with the Kardashians after all? And Vincent? Well, after he was released from prison, he served in World War I, was sent to a prisoner of war camp, survived, came home and married, had a kid, then, here's the kicker, moved back to France. He died prematurely at the age of 44 and was buried, and here it is again, oh the irony, in France. Apparently, the media who had made such a fuss of him back in 1911 hardly batted an eyelid. Art critics believe that if Vincent Perugia had stolen any other one of Leonardo da Vinci's paintings, then that painting would be the most famous painting of all time today. This adds to the notion that the Mona Lisa, with her beguiling eyes and tantalizingly secretive smile, is only as famous as she is today thanks to a little Italian man with more balls than a big brass monkey. It is fun to imagine a meeting between Vincent Perugia and Leonardo da Vinci. Would the Renaissance genius admonish his compatriot for taking something that he created for the rich and powerful who were his patrons? Or would he give him a pat on the back for his patriotism and the part he played in making the Mona Lisa a household name? One can only ponder. Something which is even more interesting to ponder is the woman in the painting. Her portrait was commissioned by a rich man, painted by a prodigious man, and stolen by a poor man. What was she thinking and feeling all those years ago? And what on earth is she smiling about now, if anything at all? For more videos on the most amazing forgotten parts of our history, be sure to subscribe to the Intrigued Mind channel. Like the video and leave your suggestions in the comments below.